So today's kind of going to be a fun day. I'm going to have a chance to address some of my uh, new subscribers' uh, request to uh, show them how to uh, to use the wood lathe. Uh, a lot of the new subscribers uh, uh, that today Shopsmith has seen are new to Shopsmith, they're new to woodworking, and they're certainly new to lathe turning, but they want to get into it. Uh, I'm going to show you what I've taught my folks for over 30 years now, uh, a way to quickly, simply, uh, economically uh, get comfortable with the chisel, learn the basic cuts, and then start turning. So I'm going to set up for the lathe right now on my Mark IV. Every project, it means you start out at the lumber store. Now I went out to my favorite Lowe's as usual, picked up a nice piece of this two by two fur, and it's actually one and a half inch by one and a half inch. Uh, what was kind of surprising though, I used to buy this stuff, I mean, every day, every day of the week for years for less than $2 a stick. Take a look at this. I used to call this the, uh, the like the junk wood pile at Lowe's. Not anymore. Three dollars and ninety-eight cents a piece now. Uh, when you're buying this stuff, you want to try and find stuff that's uh, uh, not all messed up with knots. It's hard to do, but you can find a piece just like this that's uh, pretty clear. Uh, we're going to chop away a lot of that stuff anyway. But this is an excellent material to practice on because it still is relatively inexpensive and easy to work with. And yes, you will be seeing more videos on me completing this van project that I started, what, two months ago. So I want to cut this stuff down to about eight inch lengths. Now, I'm not certain how many we can get out of here, but uh, you can do the math on that. Oh. Just get my fence set up. Let me get my support table set up here. So I'm not really using the, the fence as a stop. It's just kind of a, a general guide. You'll just notice that uh, I leave a pretty good space right here. And as long as I can eyeball each piece, I throw in there like that, I get the length that I want pretty close, and I don't have to worry about anything binding up on me. So it looks like you can get 10 or 11 pieces out of that $3.86. So 38 cents a piece for practice and that ain't too bad, okay? So now we'll uh, set the lathe up and I'll show you how to start practicing your lathe turning. And there's a key word. Uh, the, the old adage, practice makes perfect, most definitely true on something like the lathe. So what I'm showing you here today is really centered around you being able to uh, uh, practice a whole bunch uh, inexpensively we get the basics down so you start knocking out some nice projects. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. A lot of people think you have to have all this equipment to be a lathe turner, you gotta buy this, gotta buy that. For the last 30 plus years, this is all I've ever used. I don't need 
10, 15, 20 different lathe chisels. I don't need to have them carbide. I don't spend $300 for them. Uh, I've turned things from teeny tiny miniatures, uh, pens, pencil sets, to four poster beds using these three chisels. If you can master and get comfortable using these three chisels, gouge, skew, parting tool, you can turn anything you want. I do recommend though, highly recommend, one other item. It's gonna save you a lot of uh, frustration down the road. It's right over here. This is a live center. Your machine comes with a dead center, cup center. The live center has this ball bearing in it. So your wood's not uh, uh, turning on the metal, it's actually turning on this bearing. That way you get no uh, burn and what have you. So let's get a piece put in here. Now you will want to uh, stamp this, okay? An old trick, uh, it's an old uh, Shotsmith representative trick, is to use a, a drive center on a, what's called a tailstock chuck arbor uh, and uh, create a tool that makes marking these real simple. Let me show you. Extra drive center on a tail uh, stock chuck arbor and we create a actual stamp. It works real, real good. Use your uh, mallet for this, not a steel hammer. Something like this makes a quick work out of this. Only need to do the drive center side. Don't have to do the tailstock side. Now, just a matter of lining up the point on the uh, live center, right on the middle of that piece. Kind of get your headstock position close, but use your quill to bring the drive center into the wood. Line the teeth up, snug it. Don't have to force it, snug it. Lock it in place. Piece is now in position for turning. Another critical area is positioning of the uh, tool rest itself. So, for what I'm going to show you today, let me see if we can get in here closer. There are two critical areas when you're setting up your tool rest. First one is the actual distance from the edge of the tool rest to the material. I'm a little far away right now, so that's where you just simply bring the tool rest in so that the material just clears it. I'll lock that into position. Make sure this is locked into position. Give it a test run. Give it a test run, and we look good. The height is very critical too. The way I want you to learn how to turn is I want to have you set the tool rest so you're just above, set the tool rest so you're just above the center line. See right there's a little bit too high. I'm gonna bring it down. Nah, still just a little bit too high. Bring her down. Do it again. See, this looks like, can you see that? I'm just, just above the center line. This bottom scratch is just above the center line. Perfect. So the next thing we want to do is make sure our speed is set properly. On a Power Pro, I can go over to the chart key, hit chart, and get my speed. If you don't know what speed, all I gotta do is go to the chart, confirm, find lathe turning. Oh, there's lathe turning, confirm. It's asking me what diameter. Power Pro will take you all the way up to, well, from nothing all the way up to 16 inch. I'm doing about a two inch piece, so I'm good there, I confirm. It's not hard with this piece of fur. I confirm again, 
it sets my rounding speed. If I hit on right now, she's gonna run. And I'm gonna be honest with you, uh, the 1045 might be just a little bit slow. And when you're holding your chisel, you're not tensing up here. You got a firm grip, not a tight grip, on the handle itself. Notice where my thumb is, and notice where my index finger is. This is very key. I'm running the index finger on that inside ledge, I guess you'd say, of the tool rest. Got a light touch, just till it starts to cut. I'm gonna run the very toe of that chisel over that material. Back and forth. Now obviously as it gets rounder, we're not quite round yet. We're close, still got some flat spots. But as it gets rounder, you can bring the speed up even faster and cut a little bit faster and smoother. I'm gonna bring mine up now to from 1275 up to about 1500. If you don't have a power pro, check your uh, uh, speed chart that is in your uh, uh, owner's manual on what 1500 RPM relates to on your dial. And I'll just continue doing this until I know I've got this round. You know, so I check to see if it's round. Yeah, I think I'm not quite round over here. Pretty good over here. And you can see it. Still got some flat spots right here. Can you see those flat spots? Bring this camera in closer for you. Right here, we still have some flat spots. Over here is pretty round. Exception right there. So we need to continue to hit it with the gouge. You're probably seeing why I like to use 8 inch lengths. You don't have to fight dropping off the ends of your tool rest. Your tool rest is going to support that 8 inch piece or allow you to support your chisel along the length of that 8 inch piece. So now we're not bouncing around and we are round. We're not, we're not clean or smooth obviously, in fact just the opposite pretty rough finish but that's the first job of your skew chisel now the skew chisel there's your skew chisel is like a knife it's exactly like a knife and we use it like a knife to peel away or whittle away all that rough material you may as a beginner Bring that tool rest up so now that you are exactly on the center line and using the entire width of the blade, you're going to scrape all that rough stuff off of there. Thus the name scraping technique. Looks like this. Again, a light cut. You're not forcing that, but you're letting the chisel do the job. And that's what you should be getting. And this is what you should be getting. Shavings, the entire width of the blade. Now down the road, if you want to start practicing a more European style called shearing, that's where you drop your tool rest down. That means you're lowering the center line. And you literally peel the wood off. But now, I'm cutting with just the very end of the blade right here. Let me see if I can get this in a little bit closer for you. Watch the difference. You see I'm just using that very end of the chisel, the heel, right there. Reverse directions, do the same thing on the other end.
now you got what's starting to appear to be a much, much smoother, much, much cleaner piece. That's a piece we can actually start decorating. In late turn, there's really only two decorative cuts. Beads are like little hills, coves or valleys. I'm gonna start with a couple beads. As a beginner, you wanna plot out a pattern for where you want each one of those beads to be. Do as many as you can off that one piece. Now you can scrape them again. And the chisel's going in perpendicular to the center line. And I literally just pivot the chisel. You see that action? Let's bring our camera in again. And you can obviously make these just as round and as wide as you want. Skinny, narrow, whatever looks best. But you're gonna practice this very technique on every one of your 10, 11 pieces that you cut. Rounding, smoothing, and then decorating. Now this is scraping beads. Again, down the road, we're gonna be able to do a little bit quicker, do a little more European style, get an even smoother cut. Again, using just the heel, we shear the wood off. See the difference? all the way down that spindle. So I put another blank piece in, just rounding it out with the gouge, cleaning it up with the skew. I want you to work the second decorative cut coves in a completely new piece. Coves start out a little bit different though. The cove is like a valley, and every valley has a bottom, so your parting tool sets the depth of your valley. You're gonna run that straight into the depth that you want, pull it right back out. So I set my depth. And what actually cuts the cove itself is the gouge again. On its side, with your back wrist, moving that chisel like a scoop, and then you scoop that wood out. First on one side, then on the opposite side. Let's go ahead and do another one over here. Again, you start with your parting tool. Literally push that in, pull it right back out. Back to the gouge. You scoop an ice cream. I scoop an ice cream. Hold up the back wrist. simpler way of doing that. Make sure you're right on center line. Bring the chisel straight in and then just pivot. That's back to the scraping technique. Very, very light pressure. Let the chisel do the work. So two different ways doing the same cut. Again, practice that on several pieces. You'll get it down in no time. Here's something we used to do out in the field when we got bored. We'd have a little competition. But it also got us really uh, good with using the skew. 
to separate pieces. Parting tool is needed to give our ring some separation. So this technique is called uh, uh, undercutting. You're taking the very uh, tip of that skew chisel, going into the side of one of the, the beads or the rings that you uh, created, and you, uh, with gentle pressure, keep pushing that till that ring separates. The competition was uh, pretty simple. How many rings can you actually get on to a eight inch piece of material? I think I still hold the record and that's at uh, over 20. That's a lot of rings, but the way I did it was a little bit different. After I had my uh, larger rings cut, I went ahead and uh, made even smaller rings. Uh, where the other guys, they try and just get as many big rings on there. I thought it was easy to do big rings. So I'm getting ready to set up to do that right now as soon as this one releases here. A little slow motion action for you here. So by me uh, cutting even smaller rings, I obviously was able to get more on there. Look how much smaller this one is here. Push, push, push until it separates. It's almost there. Look at the small ones I got on there already. You want to learn how to use that skew, this is a good exercise. Good exercise for learning uh, all the cuts. There it goes. So there you have it, friends. My uh, quick, simple, easy way to go out and practice lathe turning. And I'm dead serious. I've said it two or three times. If you go out and take all of those 10, 11 pieces, practice your rounding on them, uh, smoothing on them, practice your beads and your coves, uh, practice the skew, maybe even get good at undercutting, you'll have lathe turning down in no time. But uh, while you're practicing, it is fun. I'm Mike Young, and this is Today's Shopsmith. Don't forget to subscribe.